Welcome back. I'm Dr. Kristen Casey, licensed clinical psychologist. Today I'm going to talk about how to become a clinical psychologist. I get this question all the time. People always ask me, how did you do it? What are the steps? What do I have to remember? What do I have to keep in mind as I navigate this process? So I'm going to walk you through my process of what I did and potentially what other people have done and provide you some resources in case you are considering becoming a psychologist. So if this is you, you wanna tune in and subscribe, is get your bachelor's. I know that there are a bunch of schools that suggest get your bachelor's in psychology. There are a bunch of schools that say, hey, we just don't really care what your major is. We just want you to have a bachelor's in good standing. So good standing might mean for certain universities, meaning study your PhD programs, that they want you to have at least 3.0 or 3.5. They might have a certain score that they want you to have. So step one would be getting a bachelor's. What I did was I got an associate and then I got a bachelor's because I had no idea what I wanted to do. Now onto step two is to take the GRE. Most graduate programs that I know of at least still require the GRE. I know that they were making some provisions for COVID. The GRE is the graduate record examination. So it's the examination that helps people get into master's level or doctorate level education. And I'm pretty sure it takes about three and a half hours, um, three hours and 45 minutes, something like that. I did remember it took me quite a bit when I was sitting there actually taking the exam. Um, and there's three components. There's analytical writing, verbal reasoning, and quantitative reasoning. I will be real with you. I'm not really good at math, so I was very nervous for this because times tables, adding all that stuff just is not my jam. Um, I did okay. I did okay with the limited amount of time that I did study. I only studied for about a couple of months and it really did help. Um, for me personally, I took that, but I was also in the midst of getting a master's degree because I thought I was going to become a board certified behavior analyst and I decided against that. So for me, um, having the master's did help in lieu of my GRE scores being a little lower um, because my math scores were lower than average, just because I'm not that good at math. So second step is take the jury. Three is decide if you wanna do a PhD or a PsyD in clinical psychology. So both degrees will get you licensure as a clinical psychologist. I do suggest going to a school that is APA accredited. It's just gonna make it a little easier for licensing experiences and getting licensed. I've had a couple of friends, well not a couple, I've had two friends or two colleagues that I know of who did not go to APA accredited schools. They were able to get licensed, but it did take them a little longer in terms of, you know, compiling all the data, showing that they've taken courses. One of them had to take extra courses as well. Um, you just want to really, really make sure that the courses that they're offering and the experiences that they're offering during the graduate program will align with the licensing, licensing requirements for the state that you want to get licensed in. So you might have to do a little more legwork on the front end if you are going to go to a school that's not APA accredited. So as you're looking through the different programs, you wanna think about three things. You wanna think about location, you wanna think about the actual coursework itself, and then you wanna think about your future self and being licensed and maybe your future goals. So for people who um, do the PsyD route like I did, um, for me personally, I was in Arizona at the time and I didn't wanna leave, so I had a PsyD program and a PhD program to choose from. And I did choose the PsyD program because I liked the curriculum a little more. I liked the practicum placements, meaning the clinical placements that they offer. I liked those a little more than the other program that I was looking at. So I decided to apply to the PsyD and I ended up getting in. So for people who don't mind the differences between PsyD and PhD, um, they'll get you there if they have a clinical Clinical, an APA accredited clinical psychology program, doctorate program. There are some people out there who really love research, really love uh, doing research, conducting research. Um, a PhD might provide you with more of those experiences than a PsyD program. Again, I'm only talking from personal experience. So I have a couple of colleagues who did a PhD and their research requirements were quite different than mine. Some of them were research assistants. They got paid to be research assistants, whereas my program, um, I didn't really get paid to do much um, because I didn't really apply for those positions, but it depends on what you're looking for. PhD programs are sometimes funded, so they're a little cheaper depending on the program compared to PsyD programs. Again, I'm generalizing here. If we're looking at two different programs and comparing, it might look a little different. As you're navigating and as you're looking at these different programs, I'd encourage people to go to the APA website, and I'll link it below, to look for um, specific schools. After that, you want to look at student student admissions outcomes and other data. So when you click that, 
Um, I'll try to provide a screenshot. I'm still new to the whole YouTube thing. But uh, when you take, when you look at that, it will show you the outcomes for each class. So for example, uh, the class of 2017 to 2018, meaning the graduate students within that year, it'll show you how many people actually graduated, how long it took the people or the, how long it took people to complete the program. Did they get into an APA accredited internship, which is really important for licensing in certain states, most states. How much does it cost? And then there's placements. So there's internship placement table. So you really want to be mindful of this before you apply to any, any, any program is what are the outcomes for internship, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But you want to know that the people that go to this program are able to match for internship because otherwise you'll have to kind of sit and take another year um, of graduate school work if you're not able to get into an internship site. I haven't heard of anybody not being able to get into internship, but who knows? There could be outlying experiences. It's also going to show you attrition, which I think is also incredibly important. So it, it shows how many students have gone into the program and how many students have dropped out. And the last piece, which is probably the most important, I keep saying this, most important, this obviously is really important, all this stuff. Um, it'll show you, uh, how do they actually label it? It's like licensure outcomes or just licensure in general. So it shows you how many students from this program have graduated and then have become licensed to practice clinical psychology. So you wanna look at all these outcomes. You also wanna make sure the accreditation is in good standing. Some schools have um, accreditation on contingency, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not super, super, super stable. So it could be up for debate. So these things you wanna keep in mind as you're looking at a program. If you're into neuropsychology, if this is something that you wanna do, this is different than clinical psychology. You'll wanna look at programs that specifically help people with obtaining um, a neuropsychology internship. Internship is really important for our, um, for our degree. So all that to say, look at the programs, make sure that the program has exactly what you're looking for, and then you get into the program, right? So just say you get into a PhD or SID program, we're super jazzed, we're excited, we're hyped up, right? And then you have to get through the program. So what do you expect? So there's going to be a lot of clinical rotations that you'll have to do. So for example, you might have a couple of practicum sites. Practicum is what comes right before internship. Internship is during your last year, usually during your last year of your doctorate. So um, when you're in all these practicum sites, you're gaining hours and all of those hours go into a bank. And then once you apply to internship, they look at all the hours that you've done all the different clients that you've seen, um, all the different types of client populations that you've worked with, the ages, presenting concerns, the assessments that you've done. So all of this is recorded. And as you're going through your practicum, you'll wanna specifically look at the experiences that you're getting and the experiences that you need more of. And you know your advisors can help you with this as well. My advisors were really super useful and helpful in um, setting me up in terms of assessment and therapy. So you'll get assessment hours and intervention hours. And then once you apply to internship, which happens year, th year three or four, depending on the type of program that you're in, um, if you're in a five-year program or six-year program, um, you'll apply with all the hours and all the experiences that you have and you uh, submit this to the API, or the API is the actual application and you submit it into the match system. Internship itself, I could do a whole nother YouTube video on. So it's a match system. It's similar to the medical match residency system. If you're, you know, a visit or a physician and, and doing an, an MD or DO. So what you basically do is you go to practicum, get all your hours, then you're applying to internship. So just say I apply to like 10 internship sites. Then those 10 internship sites take my application, they read it over and they might deny me or they might say, yeah, come in for an interview. It doesn't mean that I match to that site. I go to the interview and then the ones that I interview for, those are the ones that I have the opportunity to match at. It's not just where you apply, it's where you interview at. So just say I interviewed for, I applied to 20, I got five interviews, just say, right? And people are like, oh my God, only five? I mean, five is, it's not bad, right? So you have five opportunities. You only do one, you need one site, right? So you have five opportunities to nail an internship site, round one. There's three, well, two rounds and then clearinghouse. So you apply, you interview, and then once the interviews are over, you rank. So I interviewed at five sites. So I'm gonna rank, you know, this one hospital, number one. And then they also have to rank me. They have to rank all the applicants or not rank them, right? So just say uh, for hospital one, I rank them number one. And then just say they also rank me number one. Guess what, that's a match. That means that that is gonna be my internship site. 
and then it kind of goes down the line. So just say I rank them number one, they rank me number two, but then there's this other site that ranks me number one, right? So it just depends on the ranking system and all that. It's really in depth, but I'm really super generalizing it here. So what happens if you don't match? Okay, so when you don't match, if and when you don't match, you go to second round and people think, oh my God, second round's a failure. I tend to think of second round as a power move and this is why. Um, and some people might disagree with me and that's totally okay, everybody's different. It is really expensive to apply to these programs. It depends on um, the program itself, what year it is and all that stuff. But I remember my applications were a lot of money. Um, and when you apply to 10 or more, it adds up. And then back in the day, we would have to fly and fly, interview, fly back. Who has money for this, right? Now I'm pretty sure that thing, most of them are virtual, um, especially with COVID. So I applied to the sites that I really, 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 really wanted round one. And I thought round two is a really great second chance for me to just nail a site, you know, um, and second round sites aren't bad. It just means that they didn't find a match. And sometimes the match system goes like this. So there might be really good sites with slots left. So you'll apply to those sites during second round. And usually most of the time people will match. What happens if you don't? Then there's a third round called Clearing House. Um, and then that's when you have to reach out, make phone calls and all that stuff. Um, it's similar to round two. I don't really know the details on it because I've never gotten that far, but um, people have told me that it's a little more legwork, but not that bad. For second round and for Clearing House, I don't think that you actually have to pay for the applications. At least you didn't when I was going through this process, which is why I thought it was financially lucrative to almost rely on the round two just in case. So, um, and think about it, your doctorate program wants you to match because it makes them look good as well. Um, it makes their program look good because if their program is doing what it's supposed to do, then you will match, right? Because uh, they're setting you up for success. So the match system is stressful. A lot of people have to relocate. They have to leave their partners, their families, um, their jobs too. Some people have part-time jobs and it's really difficult for people to have to move, but it is one year. You could always move back. Um, a lot of people relocate. In fact, I would say a good majority of people relocate for internship. Um, everybody is different. I did not want to leave Arizona. I was really, really dead set on that because I moved to Arizona even before I applied to my program and I made my partner just wanted to stay there. So um, yeah, for me, I was like really, really hell bent on, you know, staying in Phoenix and, and all that. So for me, my priority was all of the sites in Phoenix that were APA accredited that were of interest to me. You know, I made those my number one sites. So it's a match system, your hours matter, all the clients that you've seen, the, the diversity of the clients that you've seen also matters. And then you apply and then you match. And then what? You got into your internship, you're going through the motions, there's a lot of feedback, running new groups, doing things for the first time. You're there to learn, not to know, right? So just because it's the last experience, clinical experience in your doctorate program doesn't mean that you have to know everything. You're there literally to learn. So after that, you graduate. Then what? You graduate from your program and you graduate from internship. So then the fun begins because then you start applying to postdocs or jobs. And then after that or during that, you take the EPPP, which is the big licensure exam that I literally still have nightmares about. Um, it's not as bad as we think it is, but when I look back, I'm like, oh my gosh, that took so much time. So depending on the state and depending on the licensure requirements, this is going to vary. So I know in Arizona, you don't technically need um, a postdoc, you know, for supervised hours in order to gain hours for licensure. So you remember how we talked about we have practicum during our doctorate degrees to prepare us for internship by gaining hours. It's kind of the same premise, only internship gains you hours for, you know, um, to graduate basically. And then to graduate, after you graduate um, and then you're applying to postdoc, those hours during postdoc will help you get licensed. So in Arizona, you might not need a, po a formal postdoc. Uh, a lot of other states do require, hey, you have some supervised experience after you graduate. Some of these are formal postdoc experiences and some of them are informal. And if they're informal, it means that you're basically working and you have a supervisor. If it's a formal postdoc experience, you're technically working, making a salary, have a supervisor, and then there's also training experiences embedded within there. So I did my postdoc um, at the Phoenix VA, which is where I also did my internship. I had a great experience with both, highly recommend. Um, and I really needed that postdoc for me personally because I felt like I wanted to learn more skills and more tools for insomnia, anxiety, all the things that I wanted to specialize in. 
So I was like, hey, why not just get another year? I get to stay in Phoenix, right? Um, at a hospital that I thought I was going to work at for a long time. And then, um, you know, I could get my foot in the door there. We ended up moving anyway, um, just because of life. But regardless, it was a great experience. So I had that formal postdoc experience in Arizona. I didn't need it. Right. So during my postdoc, I was really trying to figure out, okay, I need to get licensed and all of that. And I ended up taking the EPPP during internship because I took it at the master's level. That's another thing I can make a whole YouTube video about. So when I took the EPPP, I failed it the first time. I missed it by one point. It was so frustrating. <laughs> so if you're in this process of studying for the EPPP and you're frustrated, just know that I was there with you and it's really tough. And I, oh my God, I hated it. It was really hard. Um, but you just have to focus. And when you're taking the EPPP, one word of advice that I wish somebody told me sooner was that it's not only content-based, it's strategy. Half of it is content, half of it is your strategy. So test-taking strategies, don't sleep on those. Um, I took data of when I was taking the practice test and I actually printed one out. I did it old school. I printed it out and I looked at all the questions and then I would answer all the questions. But then on the, on the side of it, I wrote why I chose that answer. So for example, I would say, oh, got it down to 50-50. I thought about it and it was this answer or had no idea, took an educated guess, whatever. I noticed that I think it was like 40 questions. I changed my answer to the wrong answer. I was overthinking it, right? Whereas my friend, on the other hand, she was doing this process with me around the same time and she was so quick and she wasn't thinking as deeply, right? So we both had the opposite problem. So as we were talking, we're like, wow, our strategies are off. And once we uh, made those strategies a little different, Going into it the next time I passed, oh my gosh, I passed like way more than I ever thought I would, whereas I failed by one point before. So, you know, the cutoffs do suck and they, they're, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, it's one point. But I think it's a true testament to you don't have to know every single piece of content. You know, you have to know how to take the test because just like in clinical practice, there are going to be questions that you don't know how to answer. And the whole point is to figure out a strategy to figure out the answer, not to know the answer. Hope that made sense. So if you're taking the EPPP and you want more guidance, again, just leave me a comment and I can make a video about it. Okay, so now you have graduated, you've passed the EPPP, those are big things, passed internship, those, and dissertation, right? So all of that stuff, you have to defend your dissertation before you leave your graduate program, I forgot to mention that. Um, and defend means, hey, I do all this work, I'm defending it, meaning like, hey, is it good enough? They give you feedback, either it passes with revisions, it passes or it passes with distinction. Distinction means it's an academic honor. Mine passed with distinction. A lot of people pass with revi revisions or they just pass. Um, so yeah, so so now what? Now what? I lost my train of thought. Now what? Okay, so you passed. Now you have to apply to licensure. Okay, so what you'll want to do is the state that you're in that you want licensure in, you want to go on the board of behavioral examiners for clinical psychology for that specific um, state. You might need a formal postdoc, you might not, you might need a certain EPPP score. I know New York scores are different than other scores. Um, you might need, you know, a supervised experience for certain things, you know, depending on what you're um, applying for. Most of the time you just need your PhD from an AP accredited site, an internship that's from an AP accredited internship site, passable scores in the EPPP, and enough hours postdoc to apply for licensure. Those are like the major things. Um, if you're looking to get licensed or boarded, like you want to get board certified, that's a whole other process that I do, obviously, I do not have experience with. So someone who is board certified would know more. Um, I never pursued board certification. I just didn't think I needed it. Um, everybody's different. Depends on what your goals are. So then you apply for licensure and then you have to maintain that licensure. So you have CEUs that you have to complete every year, depending on the state. SIPAC is basically the mobile passport for telehealth psychologists. So I think right now there's like 28 states who participate in SIPAC, you're able to practice psychology in a bunch of different states, like a, like a bunch of different states. It's crazy. So if your home state is part of SIPAC, then you get reciprocity for telehealth and all of those other states. So think about it. You could serve so many different people. But the thing to be mindful of is that you have to practice each state's regulations um, for duty to warn um, and all of that stuff. So every, every state has a different protocol for um, duty to warn and they also have different protocols for notes and all that stuff. So again, you want to be mindful if you have clients in different states. So I hope that this was helpful. I know that this was a super quick nutshell, very overgeneralized version of how to become a clinical psychologist. 
If you have any more specific questions, this is basically why I did this video, because then I could gather some information about the questions that you actually have about each part of the process. And if I don't have the answer, I will find someone who does, and then I will relay it back. So I hope that you enjoy this video. If you are becoming a psychologist, if you are interested in becoming a psychologist, or you want to know more about what it's like to become a psychologist or be a psychologist, hit the subscribe button. Thanks so much.